In an old Peanuts cartoon, Peppermint Patty telephones Charlie Brown and says, guess what, Chuck? The first day of school and I got sent to the principal's office and it's all your fault. Charlie Brown, puzzled, says, my fault? Why is it my fault? Why do you always say everything is my fault? And Peppermint Patty responds, you're my friend, aren't you, Chuck? You should have been a better influence on me. <laughs> we love to blame somebody else for our problems, do we not? Always ready to point the finger. Have you ever been angry and blamed the country, your family, God, whoever, for your anger? Today we see Jesus with righteous anger in the temple and pe people will say, well, look, Jesus himself was angry. Yes, and there is a difference between righteous anger and all the other kinds of anger. Now, recently, <clears throat> in the last few years, a, a new Broadway show came out called Hamilton. In it, the life of Alexander Hamilton is told musically. But when you think about Hamilton, and you go back to your school-age memory, what do you recall? I bet there's one thing you remember about Hamilton, if you didn't remember anything else about him. The duel that took his life, right? And the duel here, you have the Secretary of the Treasury, one of our founding fathers, is having a duel with the Vice President, the sitting Vice President of the United States, Aaron Burr. You think we have political problems today. <laughs> they're gonna have a duel, they're so angry. And so it was on a hot summer day, July the 11th in 1804, Hamilton and Burr have a duel. And in the end, Hamilton is dead. And Burr's career is ruined. That's an extreme example of the fruit of envy and anger leading to the death of one man. But we can look in the past, we better look to the present. Over the last seven years, here in the United States, over 12,000 cases of road rage have been reported. I can imagine there are many more, but 12,000 with injuries and several hundred deaths. Anger. Is it good or is it bad? Well, here's an example of good anger. You may recall in England, one of the legislators in the parliament was William Wilberforce. In the 1700s, growing up in England, he eventually gets into politics, ends up in parliament, and he is horrified as a devout Christian by the slave trade and slavery altogether. So he begins working in Parliament because of his anger and a righteous one at taking down slavery. But he has to do it step by step. It takes him decades of politicking to take down simply the trading of slaves, the selling, the buying, the shipping, of human beings as slaves. And it was a huge effort by 1807, finally won it in Parliament. But he didn't stop there. He believed God had called him to lead for the abolition of slavery altogether. And so he continued another 10 years, another 20 years, 25 years, and he's still trying to take down slavery in England. And then he falls ill in 1833, wondering if his efforts would be lost. Three days before he died, he gets word that they were taking the vote. And on July the 26th, 1833, 
slavery was abolished in the English Empire. How powerful, how powerful that then three days later he would die in peace. A man who spent his whole life because of righteous anger against an evil in society, standing up for what is good. Here in the United States, it would take another 20 plus years with the Civil War and so many lives lost before it would be abolished here. How is it in our own day and time that we can deal with the evils that we face? Is it selling and trading in the temple of God? Is it our own inner spiritual battle? That's what the members of the RCIA are looking at today because it all really begins within our own soul. That's where all of the trials are. Why do you think God gave us the Ten Commandments? These are borders, these are parameters out of which we should not dare to escape. They're for our good and the good of society, right? The first three of the Ten Commandments have to do with our relationship with God, putting God first. The last seven have to do with our relationship with one another. Lying, stealing, cheating, violence, all the things that our good God addressed for us in the commandments. If we were to live by the commandments, our society would be so much better. But many have taken them as 10 suggestions instead of the living word of God, 10 commandments. So we need to reorganize, we need to review, we need to examine and study those commandments in this Lenten period to see where am I failing my God? How have I disobeyed the command of God. You know, as children, you've got to teach those commands. I remember as, a, as a, a little boy, I stormed out of the house because there were too many commandments in that house. And I was ready to run away. I just made it to the garage and then my father came out and said, well, before you leave us, would you like to have mama's supper? And that was enough to convert me. <laughs> commandments, they're for our good. But we really should look at the roots of sin. Traditionally, we've taught that there are seven roots of sin, the seven deadly sins. And all the other sins fall into those categories. What are they? Pale gas is an easy mnemonic device to help you remember it, P-A-L-E-G-A-S. Pride is the first. How did we fall in the beginning into the original sin? I'll do it my way. Pride, human pride, I'm gonna do it my way. Anger, okay? The anger that is not righteous, which is most of our anger, is not righteous. We're not standing up to some evil being perpetrated against another human being. It's just our will. Again, the human will. Pride, anger, lust. The extraordinary immodesty in our society today simply feeds into it. All the pornography, all that we see, visually leads into lust. Then there's envy. We often think of jealousy, but really envy is the broader category. Wanting what other people have and wishing that they didn't have it. It's a deadly sin, right? Envy. Then there's gluttony. Always have a bigger one. Always have another one. Can we supersize that for you? How about another drink? How about another drink? And then there's avarice, the avaricious heart, which is the elegant word for greed. By seven of them, you get a discount. See how the society tempts us to greed, right? Things we don't need. And finally, the last is sloth. Sloth, you might think, well, being a couch potato, is that a sin? How about for your spiritual life? Absolutely. Notice what the scripture said today. Zeal for your house. He was inflamed with zeal. Zeal is the remedy for spiritual laziness. If you're so spiritually lazy, you may never work with God. And you may not know God in the next life because you put God off. I'll take care of that later. I'll, I'll go to confession later. I'll make my communion later. I'll put God off. No. So the remedy for all these deadly sins, pride is overcome by humility. Anger by accepting the things you cannot change, like the serenity prayer. Acceptance. Envy, or sorry, lust, is overcome by purity of heart, 
modest behavior. Envy is overcome by gratitude. Gratitude for the many blessings God has given to you uniquely. Each one of us is unique as a child of God. And then for gluttony, it's temperance, right? The middle way, the via media, not too much, not too little. Extremes will destroy you. And then for avarice or greed, the remedy is generosity. Give and it shall be given unto you, Jesus said. And finally, as I mentioned, for sloth, there is always zeal, holy zeal, the divine fire of the soul. And so these are the kinds of things you want to continue to work with in the RCIA and all of us as we go through the purification of Lent and draw closer to God. You know, the Samaritan woman, when she went to meet Jesus at the well, was really unaware of how far away she was from God. God was right there asking her for a drink, the God-man Jesus Christ. And slowly and graciously and kindly he drew her because he thirsted for her soul as Jesus thirsts, thirsts for all of our souls. So we pray today, as in the serenity prayer, that we might accept the plan of God in our lives and seek his holy will. I conclude with that prayer attributed to Reinhold Niebuhr. O oh God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the way to peace, taking as he did the sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever in the next. Amen.